My name's Goldie, I'm a member of Stonehenge Heritage Action Group and we're currently at Stonehenge Heritage Action Camp, um, which is a camp in resistance to the Stonehenge Tunnel scheme, which, yeah, the long of the short is, or the, sh the short of the long version is that they want to build this ridiculous road tunnel underneath the, the Stonehenge World Heritage Site. And so there's been a, a, a protest camp here for the last two and a bit years. Can you just describe this tunnel and why it is you oppose it? So they're going to build a tunnel that's going to be between two and three kilometres. They haven't quite really decided what they're going to do yet. It depends on a lot of factors that will go underneath the World Heritage Site. So there's also going to be an extra two roundabouts and a motorway, like an A-road viaduct that leads off the end of it. And they're also going to expand the current bit of road and widen the current roundabout um, called Countess Roundabout. And this is because the traffic gets really, really bad. So we're on a bit of road that's kind of like the main route down to Devon and Cornwall. And it's part of like a wider scheme so there's like a proposal of like eight different bits of the A303 that they want to widen, but only three, two or three of them have been funded. Well, one of the weird things about here is you have a kind of a rush hour, don't you? You have a like a Friday night when all the Londoners come down to their little cottages out <laughs> in Cornwall and Devon, and you also on a Sunday night too. So is that is that true? You have a kind of rush hour on the 303 next door? There is definitely, like, the road gets really quiet and it's not because there's no cars, it's because they're all just, like, at a standstill. Um, and it's really clear that the traffic's a problem, but we know from, like, research that building roads and widening roads just creates the need for more traffic because more people depend on it. And, like, what we actually need is not just building more roads. Like, we've been doing that since the Roman times and it's kind of getting old now. What we actually need is more radical solutions to these problems. We need to localise our food network so there's less haulage. We need people to work from home or to have shorter working weeks. We need better public transport infrastructure. Like, all of, our, all of the people who work for the trains are on strike like they're not getting paid properly that that is making more people have to drive or have to rely on cars and it's just not sustainable it's it's not the radical solutions that we need to all of these wider problems in society as well, well. it works quite nicely for the oil companies doesn't it that people yeah, can't get on their uh, on their train to work anymore an investment in roads is just an investment in the fossil fuel industry absolutely okay so uh, are you actually on the route here of the proposal are you in the way or are you near because you you're right next to the road aren't you it must be actually a bit of a oh, oh, well a bit of a horrid place to live right next to a massive um, dual carriageway it's definitely helped me build empathy with all of the animals that also live next to the road and like live within the world heritage site and yeah the kind of fact that we live really close to stonehenge is like a bit of a novelty um, <laughs> i'm not gonna lie um but yeah, we, we believe that the bit of, so we're in a bit of woodland and there's also a bit of hard standing, um, a bit of concrete, and they want to use that bit of concrete as the site for one of their first machinery compounds for like storing vehicles and stuff. So yeah, I'd say that we're pretty in the way. Um, we have a weird relationship with, with national highways um, in that they're kind, of, they, they're kind of acknowledging that we're here, but they're not really doing anything about it yet. And so we've been able to like have a very well established community over the past um, couple of years that we've been here and been working a lot on like that sort of internal workings of how an off-grid community um, can run. Well, this is, this is the problem. A lot of people like their creature comforts. What would you say to anyone thinking, well, I would go and join them, I agree with the protest, but I need my creature comforts? You can have them. <laughs> I think also the idea of like comfortability is definitely a part of this wider system issue, like system problem. Um, a lot like all of the conveniences that we have come at the expense of exploiting other people like you know i would really love to be able to like drive to the shops and stay warm in my car while i'm doing that but that's actually just not something that like i as a human being deserve to have really um well, a lot of people would say they don't have the time to even you know walk to the shops their time is under extreme pressure and they want to use any spare time maybe with their family that sort of thing rather than walking to the shops in the cold <laughs> I, I absolutely agree, and I can empathise. Like, there's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing more that people deserve than to be able to spend more time with their families. But we live in a system that doesn't allow people that, and so, you know, for our children to be able to spend time with their families in the future, then we need to actually push for system change that means that we're not working five days a week for 50 hours. You know, that we're not breaking our backs just to like put a roof over our heads. Um, I think what what this community is offering is like an alternative to that, like being able to like not have to work and be able to actually or like not to work to get money but to work for actual rewarding things and investments in our future such as building our own homes or fostering these communities that are long lasting yeah okay so uh, you've actually done quite well really not necessarily you on your own but the at the the campaign the wider campaign to stop the tunnel and to stop this massive investment in the a303 haven't you there's a lot of different groups that are involved in this and they're sort of attacking the tunnel project from many different angles. Um, so we are sort of like the FINT-led, so FINT stands for Female, Intersex, Non-Binary and Trans 
like element of that um, that's kind of spawned out of like all of the different direct action groups that are happening in the country. Um, and we sort of like see ourselves as like leading on from as we were talking about just before this podcast, like um, about the the nineties road protests and the Newbury bypass, and like we kind of see those groups as like our ancestors in a way, as well as the ancestors of all of the people who have lived on this land for thousands of years. Um, there's the Stonehenge Alliance who have done a very successful legal battle um, against Highways England and really called into question the the eligibility and the lawfulness of this project to continue. Um, there's other groups that are involved as well. There's groups that focus more on like the spiritual connection um, that the land holds um, and our relationship with that. There's also groups. There's also a group who's like pro-tunnel, but you know they actually have some really really valid concerns because the tr- they're right. The traffic is really bad, and we do need some sort of changes. I just don't think that they've come to the correct solution that we just need to widen the road. It's funny, isn't it? If you go back, say, 40, 50 years, some of us around here might be able to remember. If someone was going from Devon and Cornwall to London, they'd almost certainly have been using the train in those days. But look, uh, there has been a court decision as well, hasn't there, um, in 2022, which has actually gone in your favour. I was quite amazed to see that this has put a big spanner in the works for the Department of Transport. So the highways in the the... Sorry, the Stonehenge Alliance took National Highways to court over this and basically were arguing that they haven't really considered many options. They've just kind of said, we're going to build a tunnel. Um, That's what we're going with. And they said, hold up a second. This isn't, you know, financially, economically, like, environmentally viable. This is unlawful. This is damaging. Um, And the High Court said, you know what, you're right. They need to go back and think about this some more. And so that's kind of one of the most recent delays. But a lot of people will say, like, oh, the tunnel's never going to go ahead. Like, they've been talking about this for ages. And it's like, yes, you're right. (laughs) It's because of campaign groups like us that it's been delayed for so long, for decades and decades. And so I kind of see our role in that as to just sort of, like, continue that fight. Um, And also, even if we're, even if (laughs) it's up in the air for even longer, like, we're still buying, like, chunks of time for the wildlife around here and for, you know, all of the people who enjoy, enjoy this landscape. Almost the first thing that we talked about when, when we arrived was HS2. Do you see yourself as something similar to that? And what other kind of protests like this are there around the country? A lot of um, the folks who are involved in this campaign have also had some involvement with HS2 um, and have kind of joined this space as like a sort of next step um, in terms of resisting infrastructure projects. Um, I think we are a part of a bigger struggle. Anybody who's resisting construction or gentrification or infrastructure development anywhere in the world is a part of this wider struggle. Um, it's all, at the end of the day, the same sort of things that we're fighting against, both capitalism and like the patriarchal domination of, of people and of nature, um, particularly of Mother Nature. Um, and that's really kind of like... Yeah, that's really kind of important that we see those connections because we can't do this on our own. Um, There are other um, sort of direct action, like environmental campaigns going on around the country, Um, other protest camps as well. Some protest camps um, that I want to mention is like Faslane up in Scotland. So they're resisting like um, the the nuclear bases up there. And there's also uh, Coldine Arc, which I haven't visited, but one of our comrades went there recently. And it's a group of people down in Brighton who... Um, are resisting a development um, and putting a lot of work into um, looking after the land and restoring the land as well. Finally, what would you say to anyone listening who's thinking, well, these are just young people standing in the way of progress? Um, Absolutely, (laughs) you are correct. The the idea of having endless progress and endless capital capital accumulation and expansion is not reasonable and not sustainable and not conducive to a future where we have a livable planet. Um, I would say that like this is like these young people it's not necessarily young people either like are making an investment in their future um, at the end of the day which you know if any any good capitalist should be proud of them really um, <laughs> for doing for doing that um, I think that there is a definite power within the youth and that's not just to say that it, the power is with young people but for anybody with a youthful attitude um, who thinks that they can make a change by standing up to something. And that's definitely something that we should be fostering um, and is definitely something that this country like, needs more of. Well, it's certainly an alternative to going to university and having a massive debt, learning something that has got dubious use at the end of it, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, I know a few people who have gone to university and become very disillusioned by being within those institutions and within those systems that... Um, you know, it has a damaging impact on your mental health to sit in a box all day um, so that you can go and, you know, have the right tickets to go and sit in more boxes. And so I'm really glad that I've chosen to do this and invest in my future instead of 
doing those things. Um, before I was doing activism, I was doing an art foundation course and just wasn't wasn't a great time. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Sounds to me like you're almost continuing that here. Well, yeah, this is like an environment that I think like nourishes creativity as well. Like I've definitely been able to make some really nice artwork here and have lots of interesting experiences that I just wouldn't have if I was stuck in that system. Um, putting a lot of time into coming up with creative solutions for like how we get food or how we get water for example um, or how we solve conflict all of these are things that we're going to need um, in the future and they're definitely things that you don't get taught in schools okay goldie from the safe stonehenge camp thanks very much for joining us thank you for having me